Hey, hey, what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you guys are here. Uh, we are a little bit uh, ahead of schedule here and getting started. So I'm going to wait just a few minutes to let some people come on. If you don't mind, go over into the question box there and say hello and let me know where you're coming in from. Nixon, first out of the gate, knows exactly the protocol here. Welcome, Nixon, out of Phoenix, Arizona. Go in there and say hello. I'd love to know where you're coming in from, city, state, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, love to uh, call you out here. And then, um, again, we're going to wait for a few minutes as people come on here. So let's see. I'm going to go here, break this out where I can actually see you guys. All right. Who we got here? We have uh, Erica from San Diego. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Coy coming in from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Richard coming in from Waco, Texas. JT coming in from New Hampshire. Uh, Harm coming in from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Welcome. Stacy from Park City, Utah. Love Park City. Steve coming in from Fresno. What's going on? Shane from Mission Bahia, right up the street here from me. I'm out here in uh, La Jolla, California. I've uh, got Mary coming in from Round Lake Beach. What is going on? Got uh, Orton coming in for Ordy coming in from St. Louis. Tim from Indiana, Christina from LA, Tom from uh, Folsom, California, not the prison, just to be uh, clear. I love that. That's actually pretty fucking funny. Uh, Josh from uh, West Michigan, James coming in from Raleigh, and Lynn coming in from Sacramento, California. Welcome, you guys. I appreciate you being here early. It means a lot to me uh, and, and showing up again tonight. I am going to... Um, Put myself on hold. I'm going to mute myself here real quick while I grab a uh, bottle of water. And then we will get started here at about uh, probably two or three minutes right after the hour. And then we're going to run for about uh, 45 minutes, maybe 50. And so uh, hopefully everybody here is uh, in to learn something uh, that I would argue you've probably never seen before. If tonight's audience is any indication of the last time I did this, which was last week, which was the very first time I'd ever done this, then you guys should be in for a real treat um, and definitely learn something new as it relates to um, building businesses and specifically in the real estate space. Some of the things that you, you know, that are probably not focused on right now that I can tell you, if you do get focused on them, they will make a huge, huge difference in your outcome very, very quickly. Uh, again, as you're coming on, do me a favor and go into the question box there and let me know city and state you are coming in from. And then with that, I will be right back. I'm just going to go grab a bottle of water before we get started. And if you need to grab a bottle of water or pen and paper or whatever you need to do, I suggest you do it right now. We'll come back. We will get started very, very quickly. All right, all right, all right. Let's uh, kind of start jumping into this. So again, um, welcome everybody. Glad you guys are here. As you, um, I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy schedules to um, 
spend some time with me here tonight. If you are, if it is your very first time and you have never been uh, a part of any of my, you know, presentations before, never been any on any of my trainings, let me go into the comment section there. I'd love to uh, hear that. Man, I'm clearly struggling here with this thing. Let me get this thing out of the way so I can see you guys and talk to you guys. Give me one second to set this up correctly for this is easier for me to navigate, get this thing out of the way. All right, I'm gonna try this one more time. Okay. Um, all right, let me shout out some people. So if you've never been on one of my presentations before, do me a favor, go in the comment section and let me know that if you, this is your first time, as well as if you are just now joining us, like I said earlier, put in your city and state. Let me shout you out real quick. It looks like I've had several people join since here. Uh, looks like we have uh, Lynn from Sacramento. We have Mayim from uh, Raleigh, Jeff from Houston, Texas, somebody else from Houston, Texas, Andrew, originally from Buenos Aires, Bob from Visalia, Mike from Massachusetts, Dr. Lillian Rick from Rickton, or no, Lillian Carter, I'm sorry, from Rickton Park, Illinois. Um, uh, Forrest coming in from Linden, Utah. Uh, Dr. Lillian, it's his first time here. Stacy's first time. Um, Tim says, uh, met you in Arizona a couple of years ago. Coy says, I've read all your books. Greg says, uh, coming in from Owenton, Kentucky. Um, Andrew says, I have not, but I've heard your events with Aaron Wagner and the whole gang. First time here. Thanks for putting this on, brother. Fellow Avengers well, Shane. That's awesome, brother. So glad you're here. Ted from Boston, Massachusetts. Forrest from, and uh, Byron from Detroit. All right, cool. Well, uh, let me go ahead and warn you, kind of do some housekeeping before we jump into all this. Uh, the warning is, is that, man, I can tell you straight up and, and just complete transparency here. Um, I kind of, I'm one of those guys that I do not believe in being um, imposing in any way, shape or form. I believe in being raw, uncut, you know, just uncensored. It is what it is. I'm going to talk to you tonight and just kind of give you uh, the cold, hard truth about what it looks like to actually scale some businesses. I'm going to give you some tools on how to go off and apply some stuff inside of your businesses right now. Hopefully give you some insight on how I've been able to achieve some things in my life and hopefully you can apply them in your life. But if you're looking for somebody to kind of pat you on the back, butt and time to tell you that it's all going to be cupcakes and rainbows and sunshine, I can go ahead and assure you now I am not that guy. Um, 100%, I'm going to be, you know, I'm just, I guess kind of go for it. And these things have a tendency to to reflect my personality. So again, if you're easily offended or don't wanna hear you know, the cold hard truth, uh, this might not be your training. If you, um, by the way, can everybody see my big ugly mug on the screen right now? If you can see somebody saying they're only seeing a black screen, Pat, but if you can actually see my face with a title on the screen, please go in there and say yes in the comments so that I know that everybody's seen it that way. Pat, your problem may be isolated to you. I apologize, but it looks like everybody else is giving me a yes. Okay, good. Making sure I'm transmitting here. Okay, with that in mind, I want to encourage you to give me your undivided attention for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I can assure you I am worthy of your time. Uh, I would argue I am an expert in what I'm going to share with you. I'm, I'm not going to talk about anything that I'm not an expert in, but I will tell you that um, many a life Many a business has been impacted by, from information that is shared on webinars just like this, including my own. So this can prove to be very, very valuable for you if you do a couple things. One, get rid of all the distractions, right? Give your undivided attention for the next 45 minutes. Anybody can do that for 45 minutes, right? So get, you know, turn, mute your phone, close down the other tabs, get rid of social media. You know, if you get the kids out of the room, if you have to, the dog out of the room, get a bottle of water if you need to, I'll wait, get a pen and paper and take really good notes. If you need to take pictures of the screen, go ahead and do that for, for note taking. But the bottom line is I promise you, uh, as to the best of my ability, I'm gonna make this really, really impactful for you. So with that, let's kind of just jump into exactly what that looks like here. So for those of you that don't know anything about me, who I am, what I'm about, uh, I am the founder and CEO of Real Estate Worldwide. It's a company founded back in 2006. We now have approximately about 60, we've taught about 60,000 people how to be real estate investors over the last 15 or so years, right? Um, I've been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, CNN, Yahoo, everywhere you look. I started an actual grocery wholesaling business, an arbitrage business, flipping truckloads of groceries when I was 17 years old. 
Um, by the time I was 27, that little company that I had started was doing $800 million a year. Uh, and I had moved from Memphis, Tennessee down to Boca Raton, Florida. By the time I was 30, that company had grown to $1.8 billion a year and the seventh largest privately held company in the state of Florida. So to say that my 20s were very different than most of my friends and probably most of the people on this call would be putting it mildly. I was a guy that was ex I experienced a great deal of success at a very, very young age, and quite frankly, did not experience any type of failure that would have benefited me um, at, at when I was young. I basically believed my own bullshit because I had no point of reference of why I shouldn't. Everything I was touching at that time in my life was turning to gold. I was building an empire, I had built an empire, I had all the trappings lived directly on you know, the water down in South Florida, multi-million dollar house, the cars, the watches, all the crap. Thank God social media uh, was not around back then because if it was, I would have 100% been the douchebag that we all see on Instagram and Facebook uh, on the fancy car and the rented car and the rented uh, watches and all the other bullshit that we all see out there. That would have been me. I was 100% that guy that I believed I was invincible and I could never never lose. And I don't mind telling you that uh, God had a very different plan for me. Basically, a month after my 30th birthday, on March 14th of 2000, uh, we had just had our record year. And I walked into my partners at the time and wanted to get some of my equity back that I had lost as we were doing these roll-ups and acquisitions, etc. And walked in and said, I wanted to get that done. And in a 30 second conversation, the CEO of the company at the time told me, I'm not doing that. That's not gonna happen. And so being, being 30 years old and being super cocky and believing I was invincible and et cetera, et cetera, I um, quit and I quit in a huff right then on the spot, didn't even think twice about it. God forbid I actually put more than five seconds worth of thought into it because I didn't do that. I walked out of there all pissed off and bent out of shape and decided that I was going to go build a competitor. I was going to go right back into the same industry, the same business model, talk to the same customers, but now I was going to go build this business and I was going to own it all. And it only took me 22 months for me to prove just how wrong that philosophy really was. In 22 months, I went from having millions and millions of dollars living on the ocean to literally having less than $4,000 in the bank. I made every poor business decision you could possibly make. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, drugs or alcohol or women or any of that kind of stuff. No, it was just basically being nowhere near as good at business as I thought I was at such a young age. I was good at building, but I wasn't necessarily good at building without help and good with building without infrastructure. I truly did not appreciate that the, all the people that were around me were, were the people that were truly played pivotal role in me building this business, right? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't build it. I got to build it with other people. It was a gift. And I just needed some perspective to see it that way because I can assure you on March 14th, I didn't. Like I said, I believed I was invincible and thought I was just gonna go out there and conquer the world and have no problems whatsoever. But again, uh, fast forward into December of, December 22nd, 2002, um, I finally reached rock bottom. Uh, I built a new business and then effectively bankrupted it. I'd wiped myself out with millions of dollars. I had burnt every bridge on the way down because, you know, for good measure, not only did I need to make it lose all my money, lose all my pride, uh, go through a divorce, hardly know my son, uh, my young son at that time, um, burn every friendship, every business relationship. I mean, I, it wasn't good enough. I just had to blow the whole thing up. And I do not mind telling you that it was without a doubt, hands down, the darkest season in my life ever. I 100% was in a deep depression, 100% was suicidal. It was really, really, really bad. Uh, but as fate would have it, I saw a late night infomercial on real estate investing when I was up in the middle of the night feeling sorry for myself and playing the role of a victim. Um, and it was just enough to get me moving. And I went down uh, in West Palm Beach, Florida to the Embassy Suites in downtown Palm Beach. 
and saw somebody talking about how you could find properties, buy properties, and flip properties with no money and no credit. And although I thought it was crazy that that could happen, the reality of it was is that once they kind of showed it to me, I, I kind of bought in. And in fact, I literally bought in. I invested $1,000 in a wholesaling program that I have no doubt whatsoever completely changed my life. Um, I bought a Russ Whitney program and it put me on my way. I quickly figured out that I could go and flip houses without any money because I didn't have any in a completely different industry. And fast forward about 30 days later, I flipped my first house and made $8,200 with none of my own money, never closed on the deal, never did anything. I just simply flipped contracts. And I fast forward from that, you know, here I am. I've been in this industry almost 22 years now. Um, my family owned business, uh, along with my brothers and my father is called REI Nation, flips approximately 950 single family homes a year in 11 markets. And by flip, I mean, we actually buy the houses, we rehab the houses, we put a renter in place, and then we flip those houses to investors, and then we stay in place and manage them for them. Uh, we manage about 7,500 single family homes right now in 11 markets. In addition to that, we wholesale or basically flip the paper on another two or 300 properties a year. I personally own about, uh, I think it's 126 rentals right now. As I told you earlier, I've got about 60,000 students. I own several Reg A and Reg D funds, which are regulated SEC funds that we've raised tens of millions of dollars in to go off and do different real estate projects. And so I share all that with you, you know, my obligatory resume, if you will, so that you understand that when it comes to you know, building businesses and when it comes to starting from the ground up and actually the framework that it takes, I understand exactly how to do this. But if it wasn't, you know, good enough for me to lose everything and have to start completely all over, I will share with you that about 10 years ago, uh, actually 11 years ago, um, I happened to be on an airplane. I'll share a quick story with you. I happened to be on an airplane with uh, my new wife. Uh, my now new young daughter who is five years old and I'm I, as we all are I am a product of my own um, of my own demise if you will right I'm, I, I I can I easily get sucked into the the, the or what I did easily get sucked into the building of businesses the, the adrenaline from that my habits were always about get there early get you know leave there late do all the things you got to do to go out there and pay your price and all that other bullshit we tell ourselves uh, and sure enough, I was probably closer to that than, than I wanted to be. And so I had a very humbling experience where I happened to be on an airplane flying back from one of my live events. I had just recently left Memphis, Tennessee. I was flying through Atlanta, Georgia, flying back home to Palm Beach, Florida, where I used to live. And had my wife and my five-year-old daughter uh, on the plane with me. I am sitting in 19A. They are sitting in 26E and F, which is a middle seat and a window seat completely across the plane from each other and they're about seven rows back from me. So why do I share all that with you? Um, because as fate would have it, about midway in that flight at about 30,000 feet, our plane started filling with smoke. And I can assure you when a plane is filled with smoke, we've all been on planes, that is not something you want to happen. And not only did it fill with smoke, it quickly, all the alarms started going off. We had the flight attendants started panicking. We were, uh, it was complete and utter chaos. Then the plane quickly went into a dive because they don't tell you this uh, when you get on the plane, but I now know this, that if a plane is on fire and they believe that it is on fire, they immediately put it into a nose dive to try to put the fire out. But you can imagine without knowing that and having a smoke filled plane and suddenly you're in a nosedive and you can hear the engines winding and you can hear the alarms going off. And now the masks are dropping. That that's a very, very scary, scary situation. And shortly thereafter, uh, our captain came on and told us that we were going to have to make an emergency landing in Tampa, Florida, that our plane was being diverted and that I needed to listen. We needed to listen to our uh, flight crew for and when they tell us to brace for impact, brace for impact, brace for impact. And in the chaos of all of this, people screaming and crying and praying and everything you can imagine, two things happen. The only screaming and crying that I could hear was my young five-year-old daughter screaming for daddy 
and I can't get to her. The most gut-wrenching and heartbreaking moment of my life, and I'll never forget it, that in a, when I'm faced with my mortality, the only thing I wanted was one more minute with my daughter to hold her and let her know everything was going to be all right, and I couldn't do that. The second thing that happened was I broke out my phone and began filming a goodbye video to my son in hopes that when this plane does indeed crash, that they find that point, they find that and can share it with my son. This is a still from my wife's phone. And here is a still, oh, it doesn't, I didn't put the other one in here. There's a still from a, a video from my own phone uh, as well once the mask apps actually dropped right there. So you can see this is a pretty scary situation uh, and was gut-wrenching. Clearly, we landed on the ground and we got off the plane and ultimately everything worked out because uh, I'm here with you today. But I can tell you, it shook me between losing a business that I'd worked so hard for and sacrificed everything, uh, my family and everything at the expense of them, which I now you know, I'm, I'm ashamed that that happened, but I'm grateful that it happened. And then ultimately being in a situation like this taught me one thing, ultimate clarity, that if you're going to build a business and you're going to live a life and you're trying to go out and do something and you're trapped telling yourself why it can't happen and why you're stuck and all this other bullshit that you tell yourself, the reality of it is, is that you need to have one focus. You need to figure out how to create more time. Many of you right now that are listening to this, you are stuck in the grind. You are, you are the business. And some of you may have a really high paying job, but you, you don't own a business, you own a job. The job is you. I'm buying deals, I'm selling deals, I'm doing transaction coordination, I'm doing the marketing basically, or some variation of that. Or even worse, it, well, back up. It's really simple. To figure out whether or not you own a job or a business, just leave. What would happen to your business right now, your so-called business right now, if you left and you didn't come back for a month and you didn't tell anybody? Maybe the, you, know, you did a little drive-by and said, hey, I'm out of here. I'll see you guys in a month. You guys hold down the fort, get all the money, do all the deals the way you guys know how to do them, and we'll see. What would happen? Because if you, when you got back, if there's not more money in your bank account than when you left, you don't own a business. The business depends on you, so you own a job. And that is not freedom. The reality of it is, is that we all get into business for one thing, and that is freedom. And a lot of people present it as financial freedom. Well, what does financial freedom mean? Well, if I have more money, then ultimately I can invest that money. I can create passive income or I can pay people to do other stuff, which does what? It creates more time. I get to control my time. Now, if you're in the grind at any level right now, if you relate to what I'm talking about, if that is you right now, go in the comment section there, the question section and, and put in there, that's me. I want to see if I'm talking to the crowd that I think I'm talking to because all my marking was about this right? You want to scale the business. You want to figure out how to be. You're feeling the pinch. If you know uh, at some level that this is you, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Yep. Yep. Yes, yes. Let's see here. That's me. Okay, good. All right. And if it's not you and you're just starting out in the business, let me help you understand something. If you don't pay attention, it will be you because it is a very, very slippery slope. It will happen before you in the blink of an eye, which leads us to how we go and create more time. And that is what I call my P5 framework, right? And it's really simple. I'm going to break it down for you on this training, step by step, give you a high level training on exactly what this looks like. So if you're taking notes, or if you are got your phone there, take a picture of the screen. There's five P's to this. Purpose, prospects, process, profits, and progress. All right, try saying that five times really fast. Um, so let's go through exactly what that looks like. Let's start with purpose. 
if you want to scale a business, you actually have to start with the end in mind. And that's the reason why we have the P5 framework. What happens is, is most people get into a business and they're chasing money. I just want to get away from my nine to five. I just don't want to be broke anymore. I just want to pay my bills, all the right motivations, but they don't actually, the reason why they catch themselves being on a hamster wheel, the reason why they catch themselves being on this slippery slope, the reason why they get trapped into a, uh, into a business effectively owning their ass is because they didn't start with a plan. And so I'm going to encourage you that the five P's are in the P5 process is what you need to slow down and get in place, right? And so what is it? Starts with purpose. What is the purpose of the business? What is the purpose of the business for you personally? What are you actually trying to get done? Why are you here, right? What are you, what are you really trying to accomplish? And so as an example, which I'm just going to use uh, examples uh, to demonstrate some of this to you. An example of the purpose of my business, REI Nation, our family's business, right? Is first and foremost is to create more time freedom for me and my family. How am I going to create more time freedom? Well, I'm going to put people, processes, leverage, systems in place. I'm going to create financial freedom. We're going to create profitability where I can uh, you know, buy my time back all over the place, whether that is personally or professionally. Number two, I'm going to allow customers to purchase properties from our company efficiently and continually, meaning my purpose is to set a business up that happens effectively in an automated and efficient way where they keep coming around over and over and over. I don't want to create a business where I have to always go out and find new customers and always sell people over and over. You know, I'll give you an example. As a, as a realtor, right? I'm sure I have some realtors on here. And if I do, one of the biggest gripes um, that, that realtors have, especially if they're selling to retail buyers, is they buy one fucking house. And then they may buy something else five, seven, 10 years later. But imagine if you positioned your business where somebody was buying three houses a month from you. And oh, by the way, does that exist? Of course it exists. Investors right now, cash investors specifically, on average are buying three properties a year, on average, across millions of them. And oh, by the way, not only are they buying three properties a year, but they represent 35% of all the transactions happening in the market today, 35%. So a third of the market are cash investors that buy multiple properties. It doesn't stand to reason that if you wanted to create an automated business, maybe focus on them instead of the one-off buyers. Or even better, cash transactions. There's 177,000 of them every month across the United States. Do not tell me there's not an opportunity there. Of course there is. Is your business set up to do that? Probably not. Why? Because you don't know the purpose. You don't know what you're trying to do. You're chasing money. You're a transactional junkie versus being a relationship architect. Third thing, we want to do this in an automated fashion, creating more time freedom, not less. And we want to provide so much value to our customers that they are begging to do more business with us and become our biggest advocates. Why would I do that? In the comment sections, why would I try to create uh, massive advocates out there in, in a business? Why would you want to do that? Let me see anybody out there. And by the way, I'm going to give away $250 to four people, four of the people that are playing full out with me on here that are commenting on everything that are playing, you know, so. Yeah, everybody's got a shot at at least 250 bucks tonight. Let's see who's uh, playing full out here. Shane sa says establish credibility. That's part of it for sure. But why would I want to provide so much value to my customers that they are begging to do more business with me and they become, there you go, Robert got it. Because the business, in my, they are my biggest advocates. They are bringing clients back to me. What do you do when you have an amazing customer experience, ladies and gentlemen, in any business you do, whether it's a restaurant today, whether it's where you just bought your last car, where you just bought your last house or where you bought anything? What do you what do you have a tendency to do as a human being? You tell people. And when you tell people what happens, they go and do business with that same vendor. Why not create that? But you can't create that if it's not part of what you're trying to do, the purpose. Right, so my first thing for you is define the purpose of the business. It's a rule book, it's a playbook. 
It's how you start establishing what it is we are trying to accomplish on a day in and day out. Let's move to number two, prospects. So, so customers, right? My question to you, do you actually know? Who are you serving? What are their desires? What problem are you solving for them, right? You know, I'm talking to my wholesalers out here. Uh, most of my wholesalers, if I talk to you today, it would be, who are you serving? Oh, well, I just, you know, I get deals and I just, I just flip them to rehabbers. Do you, there's nothing more to it than that? And normally there isn't. What's the problem you're solving? Oh, well, I find them deals. Oh, great. Well, you got it all figured out, brother. No wonder we're killing you in the markets we're in because we are playing a different game. If I want to scale something, it starts, this is the foundation of it. I promise you at the end, you're going to make, the, this is all going to click for you. So what, how does that manifest itself in our business? Well, who is my customer? My customer is busy professionals that are looking to acquire rentals. They don't have time. They can't go off and run up and down the street and look for deals. They can't go and, and spend their own marketing dollars. They sure as hell uh, are not going to go negotiate with sellers and take deals down. They'll just avoid the pain altogether. They want to be in the game. They want real estate, but they don't want to go through any of the pain to get it. They certainly don't want to manage those properties and deal with tenants and deal with toilets and deal with all the problems which leads me to number two, they don't have time, but they do have capital and they do have credit. They don't wanna worry about a property a thousand miles away. They want the process to be easy and all aspects handled. They wanna understand wealth building and they, wanna need, and they need access to that kind of knowledge base. They value service and experience as much as they value cash flow. They wanna feel good about what they're doing. They wanna feel like their money is secure. They wanna feel like they've made good investments. It's important to them to feel like they're gaining knowledge and, and doing business with people that matter, right? Next questions, where can I reach those people? You know, and where are they hanging out? What do they read? What do they watch on television? What do they do for a living? And most importantly, who owns this customer right now? Take a picture of this screen, because if you don't know this about your customer, I can promise you, you're losing out to people that like me that actually know this and have taken the time to understand this about my customer. And that's why you see our marketing. That's why you see uh, our outreach and the, the content we put out. It's all centered around just talking to this very, very specific type of person out there. And we know this for every segment of our business, whether that is our investing business, or whether that is our uh, training business, our education business, our software business, our funds, this is where it all starts. This is what big businesses do. They understand exactly who the, the customers are and where to reach them and how to communicate with them effectively. I'm giving you the framework so that you can understand just the, just the bones of how this can start to play a massive role and in something that you're trying to scale. Again, if you're trying to escape the grind and you're trying to get out of all this transactional stuff day to day, then you have to start putting on a different hat and approaching this stuff a little differently. And I'm not encouraging you to make wholesale changes overnight, but I am telling you that this, as long as you don't do this, you will always be stuck as a hustler. Here's the biggest kick in the teeth that I can share with you. Some of you, are, as I said, really, really good hustlers. Um, again, whether you're in real estate or you're in something else, you are a great hustler. You know how to get things done. You're probably making some good money, you know, making, you know, six figures, maybe even seven figures. But here's the kick in the teeth. If you actually want to scale a business, the hustler has to die. The hustler is in direct conflict with what it takes to be an amazing CEO and an amazing leader. Because the hustler is the side of your brain that always wants to st step in and say, I don't care about all this stuff, just get out of the way and I just wanna go do a deal. Nobody can do it as good as I can. I got this, I can't hire people, nobody can do this. Nobody's gonna care about my business as much as I care about it. I can't slow down and train people because I'll start losing money. That's the hustler side of your brain. And as long as that hustler side of your brain has a seat at the table, the longer they have a seat at the table, then the CEO and the leader that's born inside of you that's trying desperately to get out will be silenced. You have to learn. You have to acquire the skills to become an amazing leader, an amazing CEO, a business builder, an empire builder. That does not happen organically. You have to actually learn how to do that. And in order to do that, you got to start turning down the volume on the hustler. If 
So anything I've said so far in our first two things has resonated for you. Go into the comments and give me a hell yeah. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. All right, good. So my audience, is, we got, so, all right, perfect. Again, kind of a kick in the teeth when you understand that that's where you are right now. I know what many of you about the comments, that's exactly where you are. If you know where that's where you are, and indeed, that's what's going on, well, understand, this tonight is step number one, because a mind that is expanded can never contract. You will not get to go after tonight and say, I don't know how, or I didn't know how, or I wasn't aware. All that bullshit stops. That's dumb shit we tell ourselves that allows us to kind of wrap that blanket of mediocrity around us and tell, you know, that we sleep ourselves to, you know, or wrap it up where we can fall asleep at night feeling really good about ourselves because of feeling like a victim that we can't make changes. That is simply not true. You are in control. You can start making changes right now. So let's go to number three, which is the process. How do we efficiently serve the customer and make them a repeat buyer? What is that process? How do we solve multiple problems for them and keep them in our system? How do we maximize profits while also maximizing efficiency and maximizing service? All right, so here's where I'm gonna get a little gangster with you guys and really break down some stuff that I rarely, rarely, rarely ever talk about here. Um, so I want you to get prepared to take some good notes and, and to take some screenshots if you want to, but this is, um, this is some pretty gangster stuff that I want you to start thinking about. First thing I want you to wrap your mind around is you have to get into the mode of extending the LTV of your client. LTV stands for lifetime value. I want all of you to go put those three words into the comment section because if you type it out, you are much more likely to remember it. LTV is lifetime value. What is the lifetime value? Now, what that means is what is a customer actually worth to you over the lifetime of the customer? So I'll give you an example. Average customer from us buys two and a half properties a year. Let's just call it two for argument's sakes. Our average profit on a deal is approximately $23,000. So the average customer to me just on the flipping of the deal is worth $46,000. I'd make an approximately another $2,000 a year on rental fees. So now it's $48,000 a year, a year. If they buy two more the next year, it starts to compound on itself over and over and over. So it isn't a simple conversation about, hey, well, we made this on a deal. I made $10,000 on a deal. I made $20,000 on a deal. No, this customer is worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to my business. Now, it gets even better because I know that uh, for every four customers that I bring in, okay, four customers, each one worth, let's just call it $50,000 for argument's sakes, that's 200 grand, but I know for every four that come in, they refer me one more. So now it's 250 grand for every four customers. So now I'm breaking it down where it's actually $62,000 that a customer is worth to me because in 25% of the cases, they refer somebody else. Now, I know my numbers and you should know yours. What is a customer actually worth? Because he who can afford to spend the most to acquire that customer will win. If you are looking out there and you are trying to acquire customers and you're looking at it at a transactional level, well, I wanted to sell this customer, you know, one deal and the, uh, on average, I make $15,000 a deal or $20,000 a deal. So, you know, I can't afford, you know, somebody Zillow wants to sell me leads for $150 or $750 or whatever the hell it is, or my own marketing, it costs me $1,000 to create a customer. You're playing it on one transaction. I'm playing it on the lifetime value of the customer. So while you're trying to spend $1,000 to acquire a customer, I'll spend 20,000. I can afford to pay more. I can afford to do more marketing. I can afford to get in front of more people. I can, that's why guys like myself and institutions and other businesses more times than not beat the little guy because the, they're running it like a business. The hustler's running it like a hustle. You have to take control of the customer journey in order to extend the lifetime value. So we are focused on creating cash flow 
uh, investments for our investors. As I told you, we buy and rent, you know, 950 houses. We manage 7,500 houses. We own the entire process end to end. Our median house is 150 to 200 thousand dollars, 8 percent cash on cash, plus appreciation. Again, we started this whole business though when I was wholesaling houses in 2003, just quickly flipping them, right? Then all of a sudden I was flipping houses to somebody and found out that they needed rehabbing services. And so because they needed rehabbing services, we should open the rehab zone because if I can help them get their rehabbing and done faster, that puts them back into my cycle where they will buy more from me. If they don't know what the hell they're doing and they're rehabbing a property and it takes them a year, it's slowing down them buying from me again. Well, now when they're rehabbing houses, what's happening? Well, they're turning them into rentals and then they need help getting them rented. If it slows down them getting the renters in place and screening tenants and getting maintenance done, if all that stuff is slowing them down, guess what they're not doing? They're not coming back and buying more houses from me. So put that in place so I can control the journey, that I can control the outcome. I can own the outcome where the customer is over and over and over able to buy from me because I'm making it easy. I'm greasing the gears. Oh, well, now they need funding. Well, let's get funding in place because that way if I can provide more money to them, then they can buy more properties from me. All right, let's get that in place. Then, all right, well, insurance is tripping them up. People are, you know, in some of our markets are looking up and they're saying that they are struggling with how much the property insurance is. Well, let's go out and find a way to, to drive down the cost of insurance because we want to remove that objection. All I'm doing is solving problems, solving problems, so I have problems. Let's grow to 11 markets. That way they're not all concentrated in Memphis, Tennessee. Let's spread it out that way that we can help them diversify because some of the objections we're getting, well, it's just too focused on one city. Well, solve that problem. Now we manage 2,300 portfolios for our clients all over the world, right? Again, we're now in 11 markets, right? And can, because all we're trying to do is just continue to extend the lifetime value. We make it more valuable to our client to do business with us, provide exceptional service, solve real problems over and over and over and over again. And ultimately what happens is not only do they keep buying, but they buy faster. Now here's a, another example, but on the other side of the coin, is that if you're looking at it on the acquisition side of the business, right? Because I just walked you through kind of the way we can keep somebody in our world and because we can create all these services and keep them buying more from us and, and increase profitability and have them refer people to us and all this it extends the lifetime value of the customer. Well, how does this apply on the sell side? On the sell side, how can I make my dollars go further? How can I afford to pay more for for properties, how can I, you know, get more out of all of my marketing dollars, right? Well, if you are a one-trick pony, and the only thing that you can do in a deal is buy for cash and effectively flip it, like 99% of the wholesalers out there, you're going to get beat over and over and over because you don't know how to extend the lifetime value of the customer. You only have one thing to do with that seller. Where if you have multiple things to do with that seller, then it is, allows you to spread out your marketing dollars, go deeper into your marketing dollars, and create much more activity. If, think of it like this. If you are a wholesaler, on average, a wholesaler closes one out of 20 leads. That means 5% of the leads they get, they actually close and turn them into a deal. So let me, let me flip it around and say it the other way. 95% of the time, they are failing. They don't get a deal. Does it mean there's not a deal there to be made? Absolutely not. But if they just got one more deal out of that same 20 leads, but instead of getting one out of there, they got two. What happens to their business? What happens to their business? Let me help you understand something. It fucking doubles. It just doubles the size of their business by not spending one extra dollar because they're extending the lifetime value of the customer. Here's what I mean by that. If your only opportunity is to pay cash, it's not fair when you're competing with someone that knows their customer LTV and how to extend it across all different ways of doing a deal, right? Because if they know how to not just do cash, but how to do all these other things, and they have all these other profit centers, they can afford to pay more for a deal, and they can afford to look at the deal in multiple ways. You're getting beat right out of the gate. So what do I mean by that? Well, you, you know, most people just fall into category number one at the top. We, I just know how to wholesale, Kent. I just know how to buy a deal a certain way and then go flip it to somebody. But 
Would it benefit you to know how to effectively take a deal down and put it into your portfolio rental, right? Uh, because then you could create rental income and depreciation on that deal. And then you look, if you look at that rental income and depreciation over a 30 year customer cycle, over a 30 year transaction cycle, you can actually afford to pay a little bit more. Um, they can, I can take down a deal and I can go sell it with seller financing where I'm putting a little bit of cash into a deal, but then all of a sudden I can create note income. I can create an entirely different asset class with this particular property and make five times as much as I would have, if not 10 times on any deal that I would have paid cash on. But if you don't know how to structure those deals, you're screwed. Or I can turn around and buy it and sell it in turnkey the way we do, because I have at least four profit centers when I sell it on turnkey. Not only am I going to you know, make the cash on it. I'm going to make money on the property management side. I'm going to make money on the maintenance side. I'm going to make money on the insurance side. There's going to be referrals on it. I can then go and make money on funding. I can make money on title. I can make money on servicing. And when I lump all that in, it allows me to look at the customer in a completely different way. So I have the ability to play a game that you can. But you can do this today. You could start this tomorrow. It's really, really straightforward that you just have to look at it like I want to extend the lifetime value of my client. I want to figure out how to get more value out of every opportunity that comes my way. By creating an efficient process to help the buyers acquire profitable assets, they naturally want to buy more. That extends the lifetime value. By creating an efficient process to help sellers, we have the ability to maximize every lead and can't afford to pay more for each lead, thus killing our competition over and over and over most of the hustlers are playing the transaction game hopefully you guys can appreciate that when you go against business leaders ceos people who have some knowledge they're playing a different game you know you look at these companies and wonder how the hell are they buying a thousand ten thousand twenty thousand houses a year you know this is why guys oh my god they're paying so much for a deal yeah because they know what they're doing they know how to extend the lifetime value of a customer. They're looking over at a much longer period of time. They know the math. Believe me, they know the math. And so if they know the math, they get to win. They can afford to pay more. How many of you are, this is uh, um, starting to resonate with you a little bit and understanding, understanding you know, this process. And believe me, I can do a five-day seminar on just these five um points i'm covering this very fast high level as i promised you but how many can see the value that of just looking at this difference if that is you if you're seeing it give me a hell yeah in the comments as i drink a little water here and by the way this can be you there's nothing unique about this this can 100 percent be you now let's go to profits because now we know why we're doing it. We know who our customer is. We know we have to put a process in place that, that leans heavily and anchors back to P1 and P2. Now, how do we actually maximize it, right? Because there's a million ways to do that. If you've got it, you have to focus on maximizing the profits through maximizing the lifetime value of your client. I just showed you some of that a second ago. You have to run your business by the numbers. I had a really, really smart uh, wholesaler in my office today, right? And guy's making, you know, high six figures a year, but he's looking for a way to actually scale his business. He's stuck, and the, and ironically, he's stuck because he doesn't understand, or he didn't before today. He does now understand the math. In other words, what is your cost per lead? What is your cost per deal? What is your revenue per deal? What is your conversion ratios what is your time to close all this math actually triggers all the things that are going on in your business and if you know it then you have the ability to maximize profits maximize efficiency and here's the best part about it and i want everybody to write this down in fact screw writing it down i want everybody to put this in the comments section you can count on your competition's mediocrity You can count on your competition's mediocrity. It is the mo it is the greatest thing in the world. Your competition is an ocean of mediocrity. It is a sea of dipshits. 
And because that is the case, for you to be great, all you have to do is implement some of the things I'm talking about right now because they'll never do it. They'll never do it. I want you to think about that. You can literally count on it. I'll give you a great example of that right here. Your competition, more times than not, won't even show up. They can't even keep a simple commitment, an easy commitment. There were over 700 people that registered to be on this tonight. They filled out the same form as you. They said, I will be there. I, I'm committing. We have 114 people on right now. That's your competition. They can't even show up. You are already elite by just having integrity and keeping your word. You're already elite just by showing up. You're already elite just by educating yourself because your competition sucks that bad. That's the beauty of it. I love it. I love everything about it. I, it has proven, been proven to me tens of thousands of times throughout my business life that as sure as the sun comes up tomorrow, my competition will drop the ball somewhere. And so it's not hard to be great in this ocean of mediocrity. Man, you know what you gotta do to be great? Just fucking show up, do the right thing, take care of your clients, right? I mean, you think about the world we live in today where, I mean, it is just a race to zero where literally businesses are rewarded for screwing their customers over. Think about Spirit Airlines, right? I mean, God almighty, one of the you know, wildly profitable airline stock market loves their business and their business model is literally let's absolutely make our customers as uncomfortable as humanly possible while we nickel and dime them on every little thing if you want to carry on a bag if you want to check a bag if you want a bottle of water if you want to put your tray down if you want to store your bag in the overhead if you want to lean your seat back i mean all of it got the worst seats worst thing i mean it is I mean, it is just gut-wrenching to me that this even exists. And how much can I screw the customer, make them as uncomfortable as possible, and still eke out a profit and maximize shareholder value? That's that's a business model. Wells Fargo literally went up and wrote fake loans and fake credit applications for millions of their customers, had to pay billions of dollars in fines. Right? This is this is everywhere in business. It's not hard to be great, guys. Just do the right thing. Show up. And in this case, your competition is not going to do the little things that matter that turn their little hustle into a business where they, they'll never do just the little things. So to be great, just do it. So let's talk about it. Take a picture of this screen real quick. Take a picture of this screen. What is the buyer worth to you in your business? already talked about this. What is a seller worth to you in your business? Do either refer clients? What is that referral worth? What is it worth 90 days from the moment that you they come into your system? What's it worth 180 days, 365 days, three years? This is what it looks like to start going and extending the lifetime value, right? So if you're a wholesaler, get ready. This is what your math should be. If you're in real estate in general, right, this is what it should be. A lead should cost you approximately $75 to $150. A lead is somebody that didn't hang up on you, right? It's a prospect, period. They raised their hand at some level. They responded to your marketing and said, I may not be interested today, but I'm not not interested, okay? What's a deal cost? You should know this math because it should be approximately $150, I'm sorry, $1,500 to $3,500. Where does that math come from? Well, I just told you. On average, it should take you about 20 leads to get a deal done. So if my lead cost is $75, what is $75 times 20? 1,500 bucks, right? 150 times 20 is $3,000. So my deals should cost me effectively $1,500 to $3,500. What should a deal cost me, Kent? Well, revenue per deal should be three to five times whatever your cost per deal is. So if it costs me $1,500 to create a deal, at a minimum, I should be making $4,500 to $7,500 on that deal, period. If I keep the math in line with these numbers, these metrics, 
I will have a profitable business. If my math is off, then I have a problem in the business, but at least I know what the problem is. If my cost per lead is too high, I want everybody to listen to me very carefully. I want you to write this down. If my cost per lead is too high, I have a marketing problem. If my cost per lead is exactly what Kent has on the screen, my cost per lead is $75 to $150, but my cost per deal is now too high. So in other words, if you came to me and said, Kent, my cost per lead is 150 bucks, but my cost per deal is $5,000, $10,000, you have a conversion problem. In other words, you're, you're generating the right kind of leads, you suck at getting the deals under contract. So you don't solve marketing problems, we solve conversion problems. My revenue per deal is 2X, then I don't know how to negotiate with buyers. I need to get refine that skill. To become a CEO and not a hustler, you gotta know which problems to solve. Solve the right problems, saves you time and saves you money and helps you to increase the LTV of the customer that you've already acquired. Again, most of your competition sucks at this, guys. It is an ocean of mediocrity, but the ones that know it, they absolutely crush it. I'll give you another really, really good example of how to do this. How many of you on here are wholesalers or you have a wholesale business? You are actively wholesaling and it's your primary business or you have a wholesale component to your business right now. If that is you, put in, that's me in the comments. Get here and I'm just give me a second. I'm just watching the comments. That's me. That's me. Just started. Okay. Me, me, me. Okay. Whether you are, or whether you aren't, I want you to think about your business a little different. So I want you to pay close attention to me. This is not on the slide. When you sell a deal. Who owns the transaction after your transaction? I want you to think about that for a second. Who owns the transaction after your transaction? So if I wholesale a deal to a rehabber, clearly the next thing they have to do is borrow money from a hard money lender in 90% of the cases. They are borrowing money to buy my deal because banks rarely loan on deals that need you know, lots of rehab or tear downs or whatever the case may be. So I'm wholesaling a deal for 20 grand to a fix and flipper. And they are in turn borrowing money from a hard money lender. They're borrowing 200 grand from a hard money lender to buy my deal. And the hard money lender is charging them two points plus interest and so annually in interest and points that hard money lender is going to make twenty four thousand dollars on this deal if it's out there for a year if it's out there for nine months they're going to make 18 grand if they're out there for six months they're going to make 12 grand so can we all agree that in this particular market that supply is a big deal that if you own the deal that you have a lot of people traditionally that want to buy that deal from you. If you have a good deal, a lot of people want to buy that deal from you. If you just want to double the profits on your deals without spending one more dollar on marketing, make them borrow the money from you. So in other words, I wholesale you a deal. Uh, Robert Clairfield is on here. Robert, I'm wholesaling you a deal. You're going to borrow 200 grand from a hard money lender there locally. I just made 20 grand on you from flipping you the deal. But Robert, where are you borrowing your hard money from? Oh, you're borrowing it from ABC Hard Money Lender. Okay, cool. What's he giving you? Well, he's charging me two points and 10% and, uh, interest. Okay, here's what we're going to do, Robert. I'm going to charge you two, two points and 10% interest, but in order to buy my deal, you have to actually borrow the money from me as well. Okay, no problem. Why wouldn't I borrow? You just, you just matched my rates. I was going to have to do it anyway. What do I care? You don't. Now, whose pocket does the 24 grand go into? Mine. I just turned a $20,000 deal into a $44,000 deal. Now, before you say it, but Ken, I don't have $200,000 to loan out. I, you know, I can't do that. Well, you certainly have hard money lenders in your market right now because you're 
rehabbers are borrowing from them right now. Why don't you do yourself a favor and pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, John, I'd like to do a deal with you. I'm wholesaling a lot of deals locally, and I would like to make it a condition that every time I wholesale a deal to one of my customers, they have to borrow the money from you. If they're borrowing hard money, they have to borrow from you. Would you like that? John's going to be like, absolutely. You're solving my biggest problem. You're bringing me customers, and I don't have to spend any money to go find them. Okay, John, in exchange for that, I want half the fee, or I want 25. Anything you get is found money. You take a $20,000 profit, and you turn it into 25. 20 into 30, 20 into 35, 20 into 40. It's all found money and nothing about the deal changed except you got smarter and extended the lifetime value of your customer. On one transaction, they were going to do this deal anyway. They were going to borrow money anyway. All you did was act like a CEO and like a business leader versus acting like a hustler like somebody who's a deal junkie, who's sitting at the table gambling and just, oh, I gotta get, I gotta get my fix. You're actually thinking about it strategically. This is what it looks like, guys, to become a rock star in this business. Be smarter. If you don't know your LTV, I can promise you, you are giving business away. Being a one trick revenue pony is a choice to give money away. I can tell you that savvy multi-million billion dollar businesses know their lifetime value of their customer and they manage it daily. We have all bought from Amazon. Everybody on here, right? God almighty, man, my kids, I'm, I'm, my eight-year-old literally does not know a world where she does not walk into a room and talk to Alexa and order whatever the hell she wants. It's wild, right? I mean, they have made it so easy to buy from them. But you know what they also do? If you buy something, what's the very next thing they do to you? They recommend what you should also buy with it. Why do you think they do that? They're extending the lifetime value of the customer. They're extending the cart value right now. That's what they understand about you and I. They understand your behavior and they are doing this to you every single day. Apple does the exact same thing. Just about every cart, everything you buy online is now doing this. They're recommending other products to you. Why are they doing it? It's extending the cart value. It ultimately extends the lifetime value. They have already paid the price to acquire you as a customer. What they're trying to do is extend the lifetime value of you as a customer. Do the same thing over and over and over. When you can outspend or outcompete, your businesses, you get to win. You can stop leaving leads, money, and scale on the table. Like you just get to play a different game. You get to clearly track what's working and what isn't it. You get to skyrocket your ROI, ROI, return on investment, and get up to three to two hundred dollars for every one dollar you put in because you just understand what's really going on. It is not hard to scale when you are just simply understanding what the real game that is being played, getting the real information, surrounding yourself with people who clearly understand how this is done. Hopefully, if you, let me go in the comments section. How many of you clearly are gaining some insight that there is a different game to play now when you are like, you can see that clearly in my business and in, you know, people that work with, with our businesses that we are not playing the transaction game that we are thinking about the business in a different way and that's why a lot of reason why i have zeroed out why we've been able to scale if that if you're starting to hit that let's let me uh, see it in the comments give me a hell yeah all right beautiful beautiful and by the way, guys, I mean, I literally could do days on this. I mean, there are tons of different ways to do this. I mean, you know, we're, we're referring to realtors, you know, uh, title coming. I mean, I'm just giving you examples, right? Um, the other thing that you can do to manage profits is create passive income streams everywhere. And you'll create massive, massive net worth, right? I mean, your core real estate business, I can tell you that, you know, um, we do over a million dollars a month in property management fees. My train, my software business has $500,000 a month coming in recurring revenue every month. I mean, it's just passive, right? It just happens. Um, I don't have to explain to you guys what the advantages of owning real estate, right? And I can promise you, 
hopefully everybody understands that this is something I am an expert in and, and you are with what is going on in the market. This is as cheap as you're ever going to see real estate right now for the foreseeable future. You need to start buying cash flowing assets right now, today to go and create real wealth, get in the game in a meaningful way, go create cash in your wholesaling business and start deploying that cash quickly into cash flowing assets. That's how you create real wealth. The best passive investments are the ones that have less noise and are good returns. So turnkey rentals like our business where it's done for you, hard money or private money if it's done right, seller finance deals where you buy it and sell it to somebody on terms. They're not renters, they're actually borrowers from you. If you just own the paper and you just buy the notes, syndications, general partnerships, private placements where you get to get into deals but your money is completely passive. Reg A, Reg D, real estate investment funds. These are all passive investments, but it is putting your money to work. If it is sitting in cash in your bank account, hopefully everybody is waking up and realizing the environment we're in right now with inflation. Your money is losing value by the day, period. Do not keep it in cash. Go put it into appreciating assets. What is one of the, the sectors of business that is actually benefiting from inflation? If you own a rental property, let me ask you something. If you own a rental property right now, has it gone up in value in the last two years? Go ahead and answer in the comments. Very much so. Hell yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Now, most of you didn't do shit for that. So how did that happen? Inflation. Appreciation. The cost of the dollar, the value of the dollar has gone down. Therefore, everything is more expensive. One of the things that's more expensive is real estate. So why would you not own things that benefit from inflation? It makes a lot of sense. So make sure that you're absolutely doing this. All right, let's move on to the next one. Step five, progress. And this is really important. You measure everything. The campaigns you're doing how many calls it takes to get a prospect across the line, how many prospects it takes to turn them into a customer, how many customers it takes to, how many profit streams are coming from it, how many offers you have to make to get a deal done, how many contracts you have to, to uh, sign in order to get them closed. You literally track everything, everything. You have clear goals, mapping out, hey, if I wanna make, I want this business to be a $5 million business, okay? And it is currently doing $15,000 a month and our $15,000 on average deal, how many deals a year do I need to do? Well, you need to do 300 deals, right? Give or take 350 deals, whatever it is. I mean, okay, so how do I do 300 deals? Well, if I do 300 deals and it takes me on average to take 20 leads to do a deal, I gotta generate 6,000 leads, okay? If 6,000 leads, if it costs me $50 to, to create a lead, that means I'm gonna have to be, spend $300,000 over the course of a year, approximately to 50, or $25,000 a month. But if I spend $25,000 a month and all the other metrics hold up, then I get to have a business that's doing $5 million and taking one and a half million to the bottom line. You gotta know it. You need to have systematic meetings with your key team members. You need to get over yourself when it comes to hiring and managing people. You can for sure do that. Every single entrepreneur in their life, before they hired people, they had a seed of doubt. Nobody's gonna uh, like my, nobody's gonna care about my business as much as I care about it. Nobody's gonna wanna do it the way I do it. You know, okay, bullshit. You can absolutely do this, okay? Hire people that are better than you. One of the key things that I can tell you about this business. How else do you make progress? You push yourself to be around the best and the brightest. You surround yourself with success. You break free of the mediocrity that is in your life, if it exists right now. The people that are holding you back, whether they are intentionally holding you back or they're just family and friends that are trying to look out for you and telling you, be safe, don't take risks, be careful. Don't. All those people, whether you like it or not, in a very profound way are holding you down. You have to offset that at some level and make sure that you are surrounding yourself with success. Get around the people, get in the rooms with people, get on the calls with people, get on the trainings with people who are playing at an elite level and will show you how to do that. Never stop growing, never stop learning. As a mentor used to tell me, there's only one way to coast and that is downhill. You cannot coast uphill. If you're going downhill, you are moving in the wrong direction. So you have to keep pedaling. Somebody's put on here a couple of times, hey, um, I'm always learning. I love that. 
So am I. I think it was Josh put on here, always learning. That's what you have to be doing. If you ever stop learning and growing, you're going in the wrong direction. And if that, this requires, one of the biggest keys I can share with you is that if you do not take this seriously, by default, you will be going backwards because there's too much negativity, news, media, friends, family, all around us that is constantly ripping all of our power away that you actually have to be super disciplined to feed yourself the information, the knowledge, the surrounding yourself with the right people and being in collect, correct alignment, making you sure you have like-minded people that are pushing you up because if you don't, by default, you will naturally go down. We just don't have a choice. We just have too much ADD with just shitty information coming out of this almost instantaneously. I mean, when I was growing up as a kid and most of you the same way, you know, we didn't get, we didn't hear about a bomb going off in the Middle East um, you know, in our pocket instantaneously, five seconds after it happened. I mean, it is instantly, we are now surrounded with negativity and things making us feel weak and powerless. You actually have to be disciplined to get to the next level. It's the only way to do it. You have to constantly be feeding your mind, which kind of brings me to my next thing. I want to share with you guys, some of you have already signed up for this, but if you haven't, I want to encourage you to do that because I'm putting on uh, an event on February 4th through the 6th. It is a live or a virtual event, depending on what you wanna do. So there's no excuses. Either you attend from home or you come out to this. Um, it's called the Scale and Escape Summit, which is means it's, you scale the business so you can escape the grind. And this is an event that I promise you will have a profound impact on you because we were going to go through the P5 in great detail. It is one of those things where we're going to break this down in a really really big way this is your chance right here right to surround yourself with the most successful real estate and business leaders people that will 100 percent challenge you to be better and give you the roadmap uh ed mylett needs no introduction jesse isler needs no any introduction bobby castro and his wife sophia castro just sold their business for over a billion dollars and have now built a multi-family portfolio almost to half a billion dollars jamil john g and pace morby are two you know uh, big influencers in the real estate space have a huge following online or on tv every week with their triple digit flip show they're they, uh, J jamil owns um Kingly, which is a huge wholesaling operation that's nationwide franchises everywhere they know how to do they've clearly know how to scale lots and lots of business lawrence is one of the most successful real estate investors uh, in the country based out of Tampa, Florida. Billy Jean needs no introduction. This guy has built a cult-like following online. Knows exactly how to scale business. Started at nothing, rock bottom. Now has built a multi, multi-million dollar business all through creating an online presence. He's gonna share exactly how that's done. Again, people that will change. And by the way, this is just a small sampling of the people that are gonna be there. You can attend live or virtually. I can tell you tickets are on sale right now. They are. Uh, $97 to attend from home, $397 in general admission, and then VIP, which is $1,297. VIP includes two, uh, two lunches while you're there, an entire VIP networking dinner with all of the, or networking uh, party, I should say, on the rooftop of the Hard Rock Hotel with uh, all the speakers and all the, uh, the other VIP members. Lots of cool, cool things for the VIP, but I will warn you that the VIP is, there's only nine of those left. If you want to attend and you don't already have your ticket, go right now um, and open up a new tab. Do not close this tab. Open up a new tab um, and go to attendscaleandescape.com. Attendscaleandescape.com. I will warn you right now, uh, we are sitting here and the prices do go up on Monday evening. So at the end of the day, Monday, VIP tickets will be $2,000. Um, General admission will be 597 and I believe uh, virtual will go to 197. So they all go up on Monday. Um, but I'm gonna do something to help you guys here. For the next 50 ticket buyers, you're on here right now. There are 108 people on this call as I speak. So for the next 50 of you, or the 50 tickets sold is the easiest way to say it, you can save 50%. When you go over there, if you use the code when you're checking out, KC bonus, uh, KC bonus, 
it will save you 50% when you check out right off the top with you buy one ticket two tickets four tickets you know you bring your whole team it doesn't really matter it's just going to save you on all that you'll save 50 percent plus i'm going to give you three bonuses just for hanging out with me here tonight and um doing what we're doing here so here we go bonus number one i'm going to give you my virtual wholesaling mastery course that i sell for a thousand dollars trained many virtual wholesalers uh, all over the country I'm just going to give it to you for a thousand dollars. You'll get online access. I'm going to give you my award-winning certified wholesaling course. Many of you might, there was definitely a couple of people on here who said that they were kind of taking it right now. Fourteen hundred and ninety-five dollars. Just going to give it to you as a way of showing my appreciation. And in my third course, I'm going to give you prospects to profits for four hundred and ninety-five bucks. I'm just going to give that to you as a bonus here when you buy. That's fifty percent off and a three thousand dollar. Um, $3,000 in training, free training from me. When you go to attendscaleandescape.com and you use the code KCBONUS, you got to be the first 50. I will tell you, it's automated. It will 100% expire that code uh, once those 50 are done. I put this thing up last Thursday. The 50 transactions were pretty much gone uh, by first thing Friday morning. So don't screw around. Don't wait around. Go ahead and just get it done. Go ahead and buy it. I'll leave you with this because there was one more lesson. I told you two lessons. I had to lose a $2 billion a year business at the expense of my family. I had to be on a very, very uh, scary um, brush with death on an airplane. But then it really took me my third lesson here for me to finally get this. And it was a $30 million lesson. My mentor and uncle was one of the, what was it? a CEO of travel and cruise company, one of the largest in the world. He was highly, highly respected. He flew all over the world constantly for his company, built an empire doing it, uh, and did that a lot of time at the expense of his family. Constantly told himself, I, I'm doing this for my family. I'm, you know, I'm doing whatever it is, grinding, 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 right? And, I'm, and I loved, I mean, he was my mentor. I thought he was the greatest guy in the world and thought it was exactly what I should do. And in a lot of ways, probably modeled that. And then he retired at the ripe old age of 60, and that he got a $30 million exit package. Now he's set for life and he can finally get on to doing the things he wants to do. Now his fate would have it, within months of hearing that, he got diagnosed with cancer. And fast forward a little while longer, uh, October 12th, about a year and a half later, I got a phone call that he was in a Daytona Beach hospital and I was in Delray Beach, Florida, about five hours south of where he was. And that I needed to get there as fast as I could because I, he was dying and he was only asking for me. So I got in my Lincoln Navigator and I drove up the Florida Turnpike as fast as I could. Came wheeling into that parking lot on the phone with my mother. It just so happened to be her birthday when she, her older brother is passing away. And by the way, I'm 51 years old right now. 60 is not old. When I was 21, I thought 60 was old. When I'm 51 and in the shape I'm in, and the way the amount, amount of um, passion I have for life, I can assure you, 60 is not not old. So at 60 years old, here this guy is laying in his on his deathbed, all hooked up to a respirator, and all this shit coming out of his mouth, and he can't speak. He can hardly. He's lost all this weight because of all the medication, et cetera, and he is just wanting to see me before he dies. And I come running into the room and grab his hand, and then he lets go of my hand and grabs a marker. And he's got a little whiteboard sitting on his left hand side. Of him. And he looks down and he writes out a message to me. It says, Celebrate my life. And then he erases it with his hand and then gets the marker out and very kind of feebly writes the next message. And it says, I just wish I had more time. And I'll never forget the impact that had on me because here was this guy who spent his entire life telling himself i'll just get to it i'll just get to it i'll just get to it and then he built up all this wealth of 30 million dollars and then on his deathbed all that money couldn't buy him the one thing he wanted which was time and so when i tell you that this is all about why you want to scale why you want to get there faster is because you want to create the freedom and the opportunity to spend time the way you want it to spend to be spent you do not want to sit around and be have any regrets and say oh can't yeah this is cool great presentation thank you so much but i'll get to it next week next month this isn't right for me now i can't do that virtual i can't do that event yeah i know it's virtual but you know what i've got a 
I got a, a, a thing I got to go to that weekend. I can't do it. It's not, you know, what the fuck are you talking? Are you kidding me? If you have the ability to compress time, collapse time, get results, create freedom in your life so that you get to spend time the way you want to spend it, do whatever it takes to create time freedom. Focus on what matters. Stop being a hustler and start being a business owner. Why? Because you actually deserve it. And when the moment that clicks in your head and you realize that I have the potential, that I deserve this, that there are no mulligans here, that I don't get to do this over, that I don't want to live a life full of regret, I want to actually go for it, I want to be everything I can be, then you'll start making the decisions that are completely congruent with that. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, it gets wildly, wildly exciting. With that, guys, um, it has been my pleasure hanging out with you tonight. I know I went a little bit over, but uh, hopefully this was meaningful for you. Hopefully is, uh, it has um, been a powerful exercise to kind of walk you through this. Um, I promised you is I would give $250 to four of you. So when we get done with this, we will download and see who provided all the most comments. We will rip those four people out and send you an email directly and let you know and get your mailing address from you and all that kind of stuff. Um, somebody asked, Elaine asked, where is the event? The event is in San Diego, California. It is February 4th, 5th, and 6th. Let me see if I can go back here. Uh, 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, well, if you go to that website, all the information is on there, but it's February 4th, 5th, and 6th. That is a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We will start at 9 a.m. on Friday, and we will go till 6 p.m. at the end of each day. And uh, our VIPs will have a VIP reception on Saturday night from about 7 to 10. And then we will go until approximately 6 p.m. on Sunday as well. If you cannot attend live, then I would highly encourage you to get your virtual ticket because you will uh, get access to all the sessions. And, and you will, we have a special MC set up there for you, so you will not miss out on anything. You're not going to be treated like a third-class citizen with a camera set up in the corner and strained to hear or anything like that. We invested a lot of money to make sure that the experience live and virtual is up to what, uh, what we are known for. So with that, guys, it's been my pleasure serving you guys tonight. I hope that all of you have gone and bought tickets, um, and I really appreciate you hanging out where, here with me. I will see you guys very soon. And uh, for all of you that have gone ahead and bought tickets, congratulations, getting the bonuses, all that kind of good stuff, using the code, et cetera. And I will see you in a few short weeks. Peace. Take care.